South Africa has got a number of mounting crises. One is energy provision. We simply don't have enough for our needs. And the other, the enormous cost of generating power. The enormous amount of money that has been spent generating power over the last five years as South Africa, which has failed to come up with new energy solutions, has spent hundreds of billions of rand on burning things like diesel in order to keep the lights on as its aging power fleet has become more and more decrepit. Global lessons, though, that's what we're going to be learning from today, all with ABSA CIB's Bavtik Valabji. Now, Bavtik is the Head of Power, Utilities and Infrastructure at ABSA CIB. Let's just talk briefly, high-level stuff, ESCOM. How much of a mess is it in? Well, Bruce, to put things in context, I mean, um, you know, ESCOM, as you know from reports in the media, uh, just is bloated in terms of staff. And you know that they're not the most efficient utility around. So, you know, something's got to give. Right? If you look at where ESCOM is, uh, you know, in terms of the wholesale generation tariff at the moment, ESCOM's blended uh, power tariff across technologies is in excess of 92 cents per, um, per kilowatt hour. And if you look at um, the Madupi and Kusili alone, you know, they, they keep getting delayed. Uh, but a back of the envelope calculation is that is in excess of one rand thirty per kilowatt hour, Madupi and Kusili. So that is a problem coming for South Africa. But South Africa used to be one of the lowest cost, most efficient, most effective power producers in the world. What went wrong? So I think uh, a few things. You know, I think. Um, we know about you know all the contracts etc that were awarded uh, by ESCOM you know not uh, in an open transparent manner and that has obviously led to the bleeding of ESCOM but I think also um, you know the world has actually changed in the electricity sector you know I think ESCOM was really designed by what we call six packs so it's you know six times 600 megawatt power plants and that's how we have these massive Madupi and Kusiles which is you know in almost the second and third largest power plants in the world but the world has actually changed where renewable energy, gas-fired, clean uh, power is actually being the more dominant form of generation. And the, the days of these large centralized plants wheeling power long distances is actually over. So what you're finding that the, the trend globally at the moment is power plants at the specific load centers uh, where power is actually required. Let's talk about some of the, some of the trends, because I mean, coal-powered energy today, had ESCOM decided that they wanted to build Mudupi and Kusile today, they probably wouldn't have got the funding for it. Um, they, they came up with a funding model, they created these things, they've gone three times over budget and probably eight years over, over time frame with these things, which have got massive problems in their construction and in the engineering within them. But they're so far down the track that they almost have to complete them. Um, otherwise, uh, keep throwing good money after bad. But if they were building them today, would they be funded? Would banks like yourselves be saying, sure, he has a blank check, like happened 10 years ago? I think it's becoming increasingly more difficult to look at coal-fired power generation. Um, you know, APSA at the moment has supported the two coal IPPs in South Africa that were being looked at. That's the Kanisa project and the Tabometsi project. There's two international developers behind it. But you know the, uh, the trend internationally is that you know coal-fired power generation, new power plants, or even if it's secondary sales of coal assets, coal power assets, it's just becoming very difficult to actually deal with. Now in South Africa, we know from the media that there are at least three other banks, commercial banks, that have said no, even though they've initially indicated they had appetite for funding these two South African coal IPPs, have subsequently reneged on that. So it is becoming more difficult. In fact, almost any OECD bank in the world. Uh, will not finance coal. And uh, so it is, yeah, I think it's a, it's a sunset industry, I think. And uh, it's a tragedy in a way for South Africa because we've got massive coal reserves. We've got the stuff to burn. Could we find better ways of burning it in order to become more efficient and greener into the future so that we don't end up mothballing these two brand new power stations one day when they do come on stream? So there are clean co uh, coal technologies available. So if you look at the coal baseload program that South Africa had actually taken out, well, I've mentioned the two projects that we're looking at. Uh, the tariff set on that, the tariff cap set on those coal plants was about 82 rand cents per kilowatt hour. If you are looking at clean coal technologies such as supercritical or ultra supercritical, that base tariff is not going to work. So something's got to give. If the government wants to actually have coal, uh, clean fire, uh, clean coal power plants developed, 
they're going to have to allow for a higher tariff than the current 82 cent base. And frankly, South Africans are resisting those higher tariffs. More and more people who can afford it are taking themselves off the grid. They don't trust ESCOM to provide. And if ESCOM is going to provide, they're not going to uh, provide at a rate they're prepared to pay. So we need to find alternatives. And more and more we're seeing, even in emerging markets, this idea that renewables, especially in sunny places like South Africa, where there are vast tracts of land, which can do with a couple of uh, fuel cells, for example, there's an opportunity here for South Africa to actually leapfrog beyond where we are right now. But from a policy point of view, from a, an understanding point of view, from a technology point of view, it does feel that we're in a far better place today than we were a year ago and considerably better than five and light years, if you'll forgive the term, more than 90, 2008 when the lights in South Africa went out. Yes and no. I think yes in the sense that, you know, barring a small blip that we had, you know, two months ago on, on load shedding, it hasn't happened happen on a sustained basis. But I think the, the crunch is far from over. Right? So, you know, ESCOM is going to lose in the region of 15 to 20,000 megawatts in the next several years, that has to be replenished. How we do it depends on what government's energy plan is. And I think this is where cross-pollination of technologies has actually got to be brought to bear. So you're looking at, you know, possibly some coal, maybe clean coal, uh, you know, possibly gas and renewable energy. There's space for all of these technologies. And who knows, government still hasn't given up on, on, renew on uh, nuclear. So that's down the track. It may still, you know, still come to surface. Are the policymakers switched on to all possibilities? It, well, it's been publicly said that they are. So we've got to wait for... I, I know what's been publicly said. In your view, are they aware of the risks and opportunities? I would hope that they are, let me put it that way. I think the reality is, if you look at nuclear as an example, you know, post Fukushima, there were a lot of these nuclear plants that were actually shut down completely in yeah. Japan, etc. You know, with renewable energy, with gas fire generation, um, you know, there's a, there's a ability for governments to actually deploy power in a clean basis on a reliable scale without having these big, massive upfront costs and long lead times to actually build. Ultimately, um, we've got to change our energy habits as well. I mean, I think many of us have changed our energy habits. We had the, the shock of 2008. Um, anybody who's done a renovation in the last decade has made their homes and their factories and their offices a lot more energy efficient. We're probably much better off as a result of the crisis. Um, from, a, from a headspace point of view, at least, and all we need now is certainty. Absolutely. I mean, I think... Uh, that is very true. And I think, as I've mentioned already, you know, energy is the backbone of any economy. And we've got to actually start looking at alternative ways. And I think given the, the cost curve effect that we've had on, on, on power technologies, you know, I think we, it, it, the market is ripe for us to look at self-sustainability. And we're finding a lot of that. You know, in Germany, as an example, you have what they call net metering. So you could have your home as a generator with rooftop solar, etc. And you know, generate for self-consumption and any excess that you have to plow it back into the grid. Now, we clearly don't have the deep pockets that Germany has, but imagine if we all could do that. We wouldn't have an energy crunch in South Africa. We most certainly wouldn't. Bavtik, thank you very much. Bavtik Balabji. And yeah, there was a guy on TV in the 1970s. His name was J.R. Ewing. The actor, Larry Hagman, lived in California. And they had, before he died, he was one of those guys. So the oil man got renewable. And he was making more money out of the state of California than practically anybody else selling his excess energy onto the grid. You could do it too, hopefully, one day. Thank you very much for watching this latest update from APSA CIB. This is APSA Insights. And Bhavtik Valabji is the expert on energy at APSA CIB.